50 years ago, secret biological warfare trials were carried out in the skies and on the streets of East Anglia without the public knowing. So alarming are our discoveries that tonight's programme is an Inside Out special. Were three deaths from cancer in this woman's family the result of spraying cadmium from military aircraft? I really put it down to the cadmium being dropped and uh, it was settled into the soil. It was top secret, it mustn't be told to the people what was happening. I think it does matter, you know, in terms of the health of people that they know that this is being uh, inflicted on them. We came to the conclusion that no one is likely to have suffered any harm from the amounts of zinc cadmium sulphide they might have encountered even in a worst case scenario. In the 1950s, as the Cold War escalated, there were fears that Britain, as an exposed, vulnerable island, could be devastated by a biological or chemical warfare attack. In readiness for possible war, people living in vast areas of Bedfordshire, Norfolk and the East Coast became guinea pigs in covert defence experiments. Inside Out disentangles the facts from the deceit to reveal a disturbing chapter of secret history that may prove to be at odds with the official line. A chemical concoction comprising cadmium was used to mimic how a biological germ cloud would spread if Soviet Russia released one during an attack on us. Rural Bedfordshire was sprayed from aircraft and more shockingly from a converted lorry. The city of Norwich was hit over a sustained period. The Ministry of Defence have consistently said there was no significant health risk as a result of the experiments. I uh, used to work in the cancer field and I always knew that cadmium you know, was uh, a deposit in your body that you oughtn't to have. Why they chose cadmium, why they did the whole test, you know, is a mystery to me. In 1963, Norfolk was first sprayed with this chemical. At the time, Yvonne Jarman lived on Halvergate Marshes near Great Yarmouth. There was no history of cancer in her family before then. First of all, my mother had esophageal cancer and she died with it. And then my sister, she had esophageal cancer and she died with it October 2005. And then my brother, he died with it. And this was earlier this year. And now I've got it. Do you believe then that Halvergate could have a higher concentration of this cadmium because of its position and, and where the wind would have blown uh, the zinc cadmium sulphide at the time of the tests? Well, I don't know if it could have been any more there, any more than it is in other places, but I'm pretty sure that Halvergate had its fair share. Inside Out has delved deeper into this story. Not only have we discovered that scant regard was paid to the safety of these experiments, but that there were highly questionable ethics involved. So how did it all come about? In the 1950s, the Russians were taking an aggressive stance, yet if war came again, it would be played under different rules. Chemical, biological and nuclear weapons were waiting in the wings. Here in Britain, the defence research establishment at Porton Down in Wiltshire was doing its best to find ways to protect us. Porton Down wanted to find out if the Soviets launched a, a biological uh, cloud off the coast of Britain and it rolled across Britain. They wanted to see what effect it would actually have in killing people and um, you know, inflicting damage on Britain. So what they had to do is look around for something that they called a simulant. Now a simulant is a supposedly harmless substance that mimics all the properties of a real biological warfare agent. And they settled on a substance called zinc cadmium sulfide. What would happen quite often is a plane would fly off the coast, started at Cromer, flew down past Lowestoft, down the east coast, and then along the English Channel, always spraying zinc cadmium sulfide all the time, quite large quantities of it, at least a pound a mile. Some of these particles will get stuck in the sampling units. The sampling units are then taken away, they're studied, mainly by having a fluorescent light played onto them, and the individual particles of the simulant are then counted by a scientist. 
Frontline RAF bases like Cardington outside Bedford were redeployed for defence against an enemy which was yet to show its hand. Today the military presence has gone, but hidden ghosts still linger. Most prominent among the remains now are the two vast hangars which housed airships like the famous R101. But also stationed here was the balloon defence establishment and connected with that is a far darker history. Although the future for airships was uncertain, the technology still had a use in weather monitoring. The balloon defence establishment emerged from the Second World War, fired up with all sorts of secret military work that could be disguised as meteorology. So clandestine were its operations that even employees were kept in the dark about what was going on. We worked in this hangar on the balloons, re repairing, inflating, uh, rigging them. The people that, that did the weather balloon, which was just uh, around the corner here, um, they attached various instruments to it, but I mean, I don't know what they were. Another former balloon defence serviceman, Bob Musket, has lived in Cardington for most of his life. While he worked on the base, gossip was commonplace. During the time I was there, the rumours were rife about this. Uh, they were experimenting with different things. And the major one was gas, the use of gas in wartime. What you don't know, you don't worry about. And so if they're doing something that they haven't told you about, then the fewer people that know about it, then it's a better kept secret, isn't it? At the time, Portland Down was a completely secret establishment. It, it was barely known about. So it was just a sort of reflex action at the time that everything they did was kept in, in complete secrecy. And um, their argument was is that you couldn't tell the public what was going on, because if you told the public what was going on, then the Russians would find out. These open-air biological trials might never have come to light if it wasn't for people like Mike Kenner. Styled as an open government campaigner, Kenner has made full use of the Freedom of Information Act to obtain access to locked away government files. He's unearthed some startling facts about what went on in East Anglia. But there's one secret that has turned Kenner's investigation on its head. A recent document has come to light from Portland Down which shows that they didn't check this substance for toxicity prior to the spraying or indeed even afterwards. The former important scientist who investigated this in 1999 was quite surprised that no one had bothered to uh, research on how this would affect the public. This is a copy of the official report. It acknowledges that cadmium is a poisonous heavy metal, but it was not tested for its toxicity prior to the experiments. Alarmingly, this was admitted to be a deficit. Normally, a substance used by Port and Down, especially in a public area, would be subjected to a toxicity test. This toxicity test uh, would mean that the substance was given a unique T number. Zinc cadmium sulphide has no T number. No one appears to have looked into the ramifications of breathing this substance in, especially in the size that they sprayed it in, between one and five microns, which obviously means that it gets deep into your lungs. Coming up, the lanes of Bedfordshire turned into an outside laboratory. The amount of cadmium we're exposed to anyway, by which is released by industry into the atmosphere, is, is very much greater than anyone was exposed to from this. We know something that potentially was harmful was introduced into the atmosphere here. In and around Cardington, at least 55 field tests were carried out over a six-year period. We discovered that 32 of them involved the use of a specially converted van. This enabled the chemical compound to be sprayed secretly out of a vent in the roof. The main thing with the Cardington trials was the amount of experiments that were carried out per day. Uh, sometimes, at the minimum, I think, was four, and then the maximum was six on some days. so many trials were done on the same day, the, the quantities were huge. In fact, Port and Down sprayed in one series of trials in one day. They sprayed so much that all the trials results merged together. They couldn't tell the individual trials apart. 
Scientists who were actually providing the source, they were completely protected against this substance. Yet, a few yards away from the van, there were people walking around totally unprotected. There were, it sounds dramatic, but there would have been newborn babies in prams, there would have been young children, there would have been old people, there would have been people with asthma. If you live next to that route, you were really taking in quite a large dosage over a very small period of time. And now that you know a van drove around the village lane spraying cadmium, does, does that horrify you? It does horrify me, yeah. Yeah, especially where the children are involved as well. And uh, the, the idea of spraying different villages, roads in different villages, is absolutely, absolutely abhorrent. As far as I'm concerned, it should never have happened. This lack of thoroughness by Port and Down caused a problem for the Labour government in 1999. Fearful of inheriting something damaging from the past, they ordered a review into whether there were any health risks from the trials. The inquiry was led by a medical professor from Cambridge. The Ministry of Defence they invited the Academy of Medical Sciences to review the evidence after it became public knowledge that these trials had taken place. Uh, between 53 and 64, it became public knowledge they had been taking place, concern was expressed, and they wanted an independent scientific body to go over the evidence and to advise whether anybody is likely to have come to any harm. And what did you conclude? What did you deduce from the evidence? We looked at all the evidence that was available to us, and we came to the conclusion that no one is likely to have come to, suffered any harm from the amounts of zinc cadmium sulfide they might have encountered even in a worst case scenario during this period. The amount of cadmium we're exposed to anyway, by which is released by industry into the atmosphere, is, is very much greater than anyone was exposed to from this, even those who were in the areas who were maximally exposed. Inside Out has discovered that the Lackman inquiry didn't take into account any of the ground level trials done at Cardington. Some of the national records weren't available to Professor Lackman at the time. We have now seen the missing documents, and these show that there were more trials, but they were never officially reported. We do not have a detailed accounts of the land release at Carlington. We have them from Bewley, but you've just shown me some figures, and the, the highest figures at Bewley were much higher. So the calculations made at Bewley um, are more pessimistic than those would be made from the figures you've just shown me. The scientists in the back of the lorry were, were dressed in full protective clothing, yet just a few feet away in the villages, the lorry passed through. People would have been exposed to quite a lot, wouldn't they? Uh, I, I do not know the details of exactly how this was done. I don't suppose they did it in built-up areas. I don't imagine they did it where there were people about. But I don't know. And you probably you may have more descriptions of that since this particular document wasn't available to us at that time. We weren't asked to consider whether this was an efficient way of predicting biological warfare. Um, but if you ask me just as an uninformed observer, I, I think this was actually a very sensible way of doing it. They were very similar to the trials that were done in the United States at the same time. So what is safe exposure to a poison? In the States, the trials in the 1950s and 60s were more openly known about, and there were people prepared to speak out against toxic spraying in public places. An environmental professor, Art Spomer, became concerned about the deliberate exposure of cadmium to humans. Professor Spomer told his superiors about the potential risks of open-air spraying, but initially he was ignored. It was only when he published a scientific article that anyone took any notice. Spomer's article was based on medical research into cadmium poisoning done as early as the 1930s. It was known then that cadmium entering the human body in any dosage or concentration was harmful to health. Inside Out tracked him down to his home in Illinois and he agreed to talk to us. Professor Spomer, do you still stand by what you wrote about the effects of inhaling cadmium? Yeah, I don't think anything has changed since that. Uh, yeah, I'm not a medical person, but and I don't directly follow that literature, but I, I, I don't think anything's changed. Do you think the fluorescent particle trials should have ever taken place in the UK? I, I have no idea why they did them, because they had better ways to study what they were trying to find out. And uh, so I'm not quite sure why they, uh, you know, I think it was an unnecessary hazard to expose people to these, this material, whether they knew it was toxic or not. Although again, you know, they should have known cadmium 
cadmium is you know, is known for a long time to be toxic. Should zinc cadmium ever be inhaled or, or ingested into the body? No, no, not, not, not intentionally, yeah, no. You know, well, I, th I think the, the, the main issue as far as we're concerned was the frequency as yeah. to uh, how many times this was done. And this, this van went round the village lanes and, and sprayed sometimes five, six times a day from the, from the top of the van. Oh, my God, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's stupid science. Uh, and uh, if in this case where you're... If they, particularly if they had some knowledge of the toxicity of the material, you know, it, it's probably criminal. There just isn't any evidence and it isn't that people haven't looked. So, I mean, he can say what he likes. Um, until he produces some evidence to the contrary, um, this, is, uh, this is typical of a particular kind of argument to raise anxiety. It's worrying that Professor Lackman has not seen all the evidence. I mean, that raises the question of whether or not the, the Ministry of Defence should carry out a new inquiry. Coming up, the last attempt to make the trials effective and the legacy that won't go away. Uh, he was effectively lying to me to cover up what he was doing. Porton Down and the Ministry of Defence have stated that trials would happen again if there was this military need. By late 1963, the trials were stepped up a notch when Norwich was chosen for nighttime experiments. The circular, contained nature of the city and the relatively flat surrounding area provided the ideal conditions for spraying an unsuspecting population with this toxic substance. By this time, all previous experiments with cadmium sulphide spraying had failed and a last-ditch effort to get effective results was to take place in Norwich. Port and Down staked everything on their success. The Home Office was involved and so too were the City of Norwich Police, although officers on the ground were ignorant of the details. I was uh, approached at my house by a gentleman who said that he was monitoring or, or recording the pollution from the traffic. He was a man about 45, average build, and wearing a long dark coat and, uh, and a trilby. He then produced this uh, box type thing to put in the garden. His instructions were, don't interfere with it. He said, we, we will check this from time to time. I just thought it was a delicate piece of machinery to monitor the pollution from the traffic. What the man from the ministry put in Stan Wilson's garden was a device for detecting zinc cadmium sulphide released into the atmosphere. Uh, if somebody had asked me uh, uh, what the... Uh, apparatus was in my garden for what I would have told him exactly what I'd been told it was for the uh, traffic pollution by uh, t uh, him telling me all this I, I was uh, perpetuating a lie to uh, anybody else who was inquiring about it I, I, I feel uh, completely disgusted that they should have used this cadmium sulfide when they knew that it was uh, a, a very dangerous poison no one was to know as we, we now know, police officers were involved, they were not told why. On the nights the trials took place, a convoy of vehicles would leave RAF Swanton Morley. An operative from the Chemical Defence Establishment would head the team on their top secret mission. They drove to various locations on the outskirts of Norwich to install sampling devices set up to detect clouds of zinc cadmium particles which would imminently be released from a military aircraft and carried on the wind. An aircraft would take off, it would fly 25 miles away from the centre of Norwich at night. It would be spraying out zinc cadmium sulphide all the time. As the cloud approached Norwich at night, there was, uh, Porton had a mobile dark room that would be at the leading edge of the cloud. It would take a, a air samples at it every few minutes, quickly shine a, a UV light onto the samples just to see if there anything fluoresced. The minute anything fluoresced uh, in, in, in great numbers, they knew that they had this uh, zinc cadmium sulphide cloud coming through. Arrival is 25 and counting. The official Porton history of the zinc cadmium sulfide program 
says a very strange thing about Norwich. It says that the exposure was, however, considerable. This is a very strange statement. They do not make this statement for the rest of the trials that were carried out, and there's over 100 of them in the UK. But in Norwich, they, they specifically mentioned that it was a considerable exposure. The Ministry of Defence declined to be interviewed for this programme, but they did issue this statement. Zinc cadmium sulphide was widely used at the time of the trials by a number of different countries as an air movement tracer in meteorology and was regarded as safe. Cadmium naturally resides in the soil, but any increase in the levels present as a result of these trials and any potential health risks are causing concern. Jean Cordy grew up next to an allotment where one of these sampling machines was placed. I believe that there could be a link between my mother's cancer and the tests that were carried out over Norwich from the fact that we, we ate our own vegetables that my father grew. I'm also concerned that my brother and I, as we ate the same produce, might actually end up with the same disease as my parents did. My mother was um, a brilliant grandmother, absolutely adored her grandchildren and she always looked on them as her boys, always used to ask how her boys were and I know of anything that they'd miss her and you know she, she missed seeing them growing up which is unfair. We do indeed see more uh, patients, newly diagnosed patients with esophageal cancer than we might expect to see for the population and certainly compared to some other parts of the country. Many of them will have worked on or lived off the land, it's quite striking, but I think that probably reflects the part of the country that, that we're in. We're in a part of the country that's, of course, intensely agricultural, um, and I think that to some extent reflects that, but it is, it is something that would, I think, make one look for a possible link. Last winter, Wynn Parry and Norwich North MP Dr Ian Gibson, amid a flurry of newspaper coverage, forced a health inquiry. It reported that there were indeed significantly high numbers of throat cancer in Norfolk. There's some kind of evidence there might be clusters and so on, but you see, you would never know because a lot of these agents wouldn't just go into people's bodies, but they would go into the crops that they ate as well. And this being a crop growing area at that time, who knows? Who knows what people recorded on death certificates or records on what's wrong with people and so on. A second study, this time by Imperial College, confirmed the higher trend of cancer in Norfolk. However, once the figures were adjusted to reflect age and gender, they said it's unlikely that exposure to the toxic spraying is to blame. Now the Chief Medical Officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, has concluded that there is no excess risk to throat cancer across Norfolk compared to the rest of the country. Somebody should be running around Norfolk now to see how much esophageal cancer there really is, what's been missed and what the true figure might be. Maybe Wynn Parry is the man to do it. It's a case unproven and we have two facts. We have uh, the fact that we have many more patients with cancer of the esophagus in Norfolk than we might expect to see uh, f for our population. Uh, and we also have the fact that in the 1960s, a chemical was dropped over part of Norfolk and, and a sizable part of Norwich uh, that we know can cause health risks. They are two separate facts and it would be speculation to link them, but as a scientist I think it would be uh, sensible to look at that, which is something that we would hope to be able to do in the fullness of time. But what about Cardington and Bedfordshire? The local MP Alistair Burt knew nothing of the trials which affected so much of his constituency. Inside Out showed him the details of what we discovered. So Alistair, you, you've had a chance to look at this report now. Just how shocked are you that zinc cadmium sulphide was sprayed under the back of a lorry? It does seem quite extraordinary that it was done in that way because when you think of the height of the particles when they came out, they'd have been incredibly close to land, to, to people. They wouldn't have been as easily dispersed in the air as they would have been if they'd been dropped from an aeroplane and it does seem an extraordinary story. So what are you going to do now? I mean, you know, you, you, are you going to take this to somebody and say, hey, you know, what was going on all those years ago? I think there's an issue about the times that this was done in, and I think people were more uh, unquestioning about what happened then, and I, I think there's a certain amount of that that it's not possible to reopen. But plainly, whether or not there was any impact from what happened then as to what's happening today in terms of health, 
it is terribly important to discover. What answers will you be looking for about the way things were carried out here? I think my constituents are entitled to the same answers as MPs have sought in different parts of the country in terms of what these trials were about, what precisely happened here, any possible consequences. But in particular, because of the way in which these trials were carried out, the fact that they were done so differently here, the lorry travelling around, the numbers of times per day they were done, the way in which the stuff was produced and, and, and introduced into the atmosphere here, that's palpably different as far as we're aware from what may have happened somewhere else. Now, accordingly, I think it's up to me to talk to the health authorities here in Bedfordshire to ask them whether there's any possibility of there being any incidences of cancer, any clusters of cancer that might possibly have been related to this. And I think that work has to start now because with this being so long covered over, having brought it to mind now, we've got to find out in order to reassure people to make sure they know that they're safe. From what we understand of, of cadmium, it, it can remain in the environment for some time afterwards. I think if they were aware of the, the full spectrum of risks, then uh, it was probably questionable at the very best. The question whether this was a correct thing to do is, as I say, not a question that we were asked to approach. That's a question for government. I mean, one can see that in the 21st century that would probably be considered very improper. But at the height of the Cold War, people's views on this may have been slightly different. And although one is always terribly sympathetic to people who are are sick. Um, it's terribly dangerous um, to, for this reason, impose causality on things that happen to be in your mind, that there is really no reason to believe that anybody came to any health harm from it. Well, I've read Professor Lackman's report. I think he's an excellent scientist, good at analysing data, but he's only as good at analysing as the data he actually gets. I think uh, there are lots of gaps that uh, need to be uh, covered and uh, looked into. Now they have to admit that actually since the tests, doubts about the safety of that compound have arisen. And that, I think that's very politically damaging for them. And the problem that they've got is, is that they're left with not very reliable data, but also the other, the other problem that they have is, is that they've released a whole load of material out into the countryside and they're not absolutely sure how much they have actually released, which causes them a problem when they're asserting that it's completely safe. I mean, it's a bit of a cock-up, really. I'm not particularly looking forward to what the times ahead because it's certainly not a very pleasant death. And I think this is an absolute dreadful thing. I think they're just sweeping everything under the carpet and just how they always do with everything. Quite often, it's just getting that public apology that's important. Some minister, some prime minister, has to stand up and say sorry about what happened years ago. The population of Norfolk, the population of, around Bedford, in, in fact the whole east of, of England, could still be at risk from future experiments, which the Ministry of Defence refused to rule out. There's more background to this story on our website, bbc.co.uk slash inside out. Next week, a network inside out special on the rise of Eastern European immigration. And in two weeks, another chance to see Heidi's story of hope in America. We'll be back for a new series in January when we move to a Wednesday night. Keep your surprising stories coming from all the team. Bye-bye.